My name's Dusty Desha. I'm a judge here in Missoula nowadays, <coughs> but I'm a uh, uh, lifelong Missoula resident. Uh, I, I live most of my life, still live out east of town, uh, between East Missoula and, and uh, Montana, not that area. Uh, and most of the events I'm going to talk about actually occurred in that same neighborhood. But back in the 60s, I decided to go to law school. Uh, not necessarily because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but Vietnam was going on. I wasn't too interested in going over there. Uh, what the heck, I'll give it a try. And even if I decide to do something else, anything I learned in law school would probably be useful later. So I went to law school, but in the fall of 1968, uh, I, I was out hunting back up above Marshall Ski Area out in that area. And I fell down and accidentally shot myself in the stomach. Went in here and came up right back here. Well, the wound was pretty serious. Uh, I, I was alone, I walked out, kept my truck, drove myself to the hospital. But I had to drop out of school that semester while I recovered. Uh, and while I was recuperating, I went to work for the city of Missoula as a uh, intern in, in a city police court to prosecute traffic tickets most of the time. Uh, I ended up graduating then in, in mid-year, in January of 1970. And in January 1970, there was an opening in the county attorney's office. I applied for it and was hired, and more than likely it was the only applicant because it was a really crappy job. Paid $475 a month. Uh, <laughs> take-home was 307 and so I don't think there were a whole lot of takers. <coughs> and the county attorney at that time was a fellow by the name of Jack Pinsno. Pinsno decided that he'd had enough and he wasn't going to run again. And in those days, literally anybody could run for county attorney and I said, well, heck, I'll do it. So I did. I ran and I got elected in the fall of 1970 took over as a county attorney of Missoula County in, uh, in January 19, 1971. The guy that uh, was elected sheriff that year was a retired FBI agent by the name of uh, John C. Moan, who, who was a very uh, respected law enforcement officer. The guy with the mustache is me. This is a picture from the 80s, but the picture of the guy in the hat is the sheriff in the early 70s, John Moe. Uh, and so, uh, John and I and the law enforcement had lots of interesting experiences in the early years of the 70s, but, but the one I'm here to talk about today occurred, started in the spring, late winter of 1973, uh, when a little girl by the name of Siobhan McGinnis, who was about seven or eight years old, was walking home from, her home, from school to her home over here on the north side of Missoula. About three blocks, but she didn't make it, didn't show up. So this huge search uh, was undertaken to try to find her. What happened to this little girl? I mean, the community was in an uproar, and uh, the search went on for two or three days, and finally, after about three days, somebody uh, noticed dogs chewing on something in the, in the uh, ditch on the, along the interstate out between uh, Hillsville and Tura, out east of town. The investigation showed that it was the body of Siobhan McGinnis that had been stuffed inside a culvert and dogs had come along and pulled her out. Uh, the autopsy on her body showed that although she had some blunt force injuries to her head and some superficial cuts on her chest, uh, which she died of, was exposure. Uh, she was, was, was likely sexually molested as well. And she died from exposure. Well, it was a horrible crime. The community was, in a, you know, understandably, really upset. Uh, but we really didn't have any good suspects. There were some leads, but uh, nothing very common. <clears throat> well, about two months later, right, right at Easter, uh, 
there was a family that lived out in West Riverside. Uh, and this family's name was, was Harvey and Donna Pounds. Uh, they were devout Christians. In fact, Harvey was a minister for a local fundamentalist church. Uh, Donna was a stay-at-home mom. They had at least three kids, maybe four. They had two kids in, in grade school at Bonner and a son in high school here in town. And it seems like there might have been another daughter too. But in any case, uh, uh, on, on this day on the Easter weekend, or near the, maybe it was Good Friday, Kids had gone to school, came home on the bus at 3.30 as they normally did, but their mother wasn't home when they got there. What they did see was in the bathroom, there were white clothesline rope chunks tied around the toilet bowl, tied around uh, the doorknob, tied around uh, the hinges on the doors. Very strange. Uh, in the master bedroom, there was more white clothesline rope chunks tied to the four corners of the bed. Uh, and I think there might have been some around the hinges, the door posts in there too. Uh, there was a pair of her panties that had been cut with a couple in the middle of the bed. And there was a throw rug on the floor in the master bedroom. It was all rumpled up as if it had been some kind of a ruckus, but no mom, no blood, no nothing. So the kids turned on the TV and watched TV till their dad got home about 5.15. They said, Dad, you know, we can't find mom. So he goes wandering around the house, eventually goes down in the basement, the long basement stairway and then around the corner. And around the corner at the bottom of the stairs is his wife's body. Now she'd been bound uh, by with her hands behind her back and also by her, her ankles with more of this white clothesline. Uh, her upper clothing had been cut so that her torso was exposed and the clothing was pulled up around her, her shoulders and her pants had been pulled down so they were down around her ankles. She had six execution style bullet holes in the back of her head. And the gun that had been used, which was a gun in the house that had been kept in the drawer in the master bedroom, was stuck between her legs with just the butt of the pistol sticking out from between her legs. Well, the husband, Harvey, calls the uh, law enforcement. Of course, they get out there. And I, 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 as a county attorney, I went to the scene and saw all these things. Well, we started doing door-to-door uh, -door interviews with people in the neighborhood to see if anybody saw it. Well, uh, a couple people did see something. There was one person who said, well, we thought we saw this weird kid from the neighborhood in the yard uh, around noon then. His name is Wayne Nance. Uh, another witness said, well, we thought we saw this, this kid name is Wayne Nance, walking across a field away from the house and kind of eastward towards uh, the direction of what used to be the Club Chateau. And this uh, person was carrying a black bag. Well, there were other other people in the vicinity that sort of matched his, his description. So it could have been a case of mistaken identity. Um, uh, the wasn't really enough there to uh, bring charges or do anything. Uh, and the sheriff, John Moe, had his own uh, favorite suspect. His suspect was the husband, Harvey Pounds. Now most most cases of murder are committed by somebody who knows something. Most of the time they're crimes of passion. Uh, and so, you know, the husband is a good suspect. And there was some some reason to think the husband might have done it because as a uh, Christian minister uh, he had engaged in some kind of a uh, relationship with a female member of the congregation and 
because of his beliefs, he could not marry her, couldn't get a divorce. The only way he'd be free to follow up on his, uh, uh, his romance would be if he was a widow. Moreover, he, he didn't have a good explanation for where he was at. He was at work, but nobody could account for him for about an hour and a half during the noon hours. He said he was up in the mezzanine of the uh, men's store eating lunch, but nobody could verify that. <clears throat> and so there would have been enough time to have made it from Yance Men's were out to uh, West Riverside, do this crime and get back in, in the time that he was basically on the county. So that was the sheriff suspect. I tended to prefer Wayne Nance, but we really didn't have much to go on with either one of them beyond what I just said. Uh, I should say that Wayne was a friend of their son Pound's son and had actually been in the house and was one of the few people that actually knew where the gun was kept and had actually shot it. Well, uh, all this is going on and then a year later, at about the same time, uh, in the spring of the following year, uh, at Easter, uh, there was a school teacher in town here by the name of Donna Cavalli. Uh, Donna was a very attractive, but somewhat uh, uh, fast living uh, person. Lots of boyfriends and lots of questionable moral conduct. Uh, and she was supposed to go up and have Easter dinner with her family uh, who lived up in Polson. Well, she didn't show up. So her mother tried calling her, couldn't get her to answer the phone. The mother calls the sheriff of Lake County and says, hey, Donna uh, was supposed to come for dinner. I can't get a hold of her. I can't. She didn't show up. Could you go down to Missoula and see if you can find her? So the sheriff pulls and drives down to Missoula, goes to her house, which is over in the Slant Street area on the south side, goes and looks in the window, and he sees on the kitchen table uh, naked body with a knife sticking out of his chest. So he calls law enforcement. They respond, go in. I, they call me. I went. I saw it. And there she is, naked on, on a kitchen table with his knife sticking out of her chest. And whoever had done it had moved the knife around something. It was a pretty awful looking hole. And I, I envisioned this monster butcher knife. It turned out to be a steak knife, but it looked much worse than that when I saw it. But the, the, the most interesting feature was there was a blob of semen on her thigh. Now this was the mid-70s. We didn't have DNA. Most we could do with that kind of fluid would be uh, blood type. So we did blood type it. And, uh, it wasn't Wayne Nance's blood type, I'll tell you that. Uh, but, you know, blood type, that wasn't enough to really do much with. Meanwhile, we had a couple other unrelated homicides. There was an attorney that was killed here in town, and some other stuff, and the community started to get pretty panicked over all these unsolved murders. And of course, they're blaming law enforcement for that unsolved. And there was lots of theories that it was a satanic cult uh, because uh, the satanic cult had killed a virgin, uh, Siobhan McGinnis, killed a Christian, a lot of pounds, uh, killed a woman of loose morals, Donna Cavalli, uh, and there was some ritual going on, and so the question was, who's next? Who's going to be the next one? Uh, and, like I say, the community's in an uproar, and at the time we didn't have a lot of the investigative tools we now have available to us, so I thought, you know, the best thing to do is try to figure out some way we can get all these people in and question them and produce evidence and what have you, try to get to the bottom of this stuff. So I asked one of the local judges to panel a grand jury. He agreed and we did. Been the one and only grand jury in uh, Missoula County probably in the last hundred years, but we did it. And we started subpoenaing in these witnesses, including Wayne Nance, who by this point <coughs> had graduated from high school and was in the Navy. 
uh, and stationed at that point in time in, in uh, San Diego. Uh, so I subpoenaed Wayne Nance up and get him on the witness stand and, and uh, I, I learned through investigation that he he wasn't in school. He was supposed to be at school and he wasn't. So I put him on the stand I said, Wayne, where were you on the afternoon of Don Clouds' trip? You weren't in school. He says, well, I was home, but I was working on a tomahawk project. I had this class in archaeology, and I had made this tomahawk. It was really a great tomahawk. Uh, and in fact, it was so good, I got an A for it. That's what I was doing. So uh, he, he was let down off the stand. I get a hold of the teacher and said, what, what about this tomahawk? teacher said, well, yeah, I did make a tomahawk, and it was a good one, and he did get an A for it, but the class was in the fall, and this murder occurred the following spring. So I bring him, Wayne back in, and I confront him with his lie, <laughs> confront him with everything I could come up with, and, and my reaction was, he was just as, as cool and calm and collected as that tombstone. I mean, he was just nothing phased just matter of fact and unflappable. Uh, we also of course brought in Harvey Pounds and questioned him and, and the grand jury was unable to indict anybody although they actually came closer to indicting uh, Harvey Pounds the husband than they did Wayne Nance. But all this kind of goes into the into the lore of Missoula and things go on until uh, the early 80s. And uh, all of a sudden, in the early 80s, you start finding dead bodies of females out in eastern Missoula. Um, and I might have the sequence of events here mixed up a little bit. But, but the first one, I believe, was uh, there was a hiker out kind of above the Milltown Dam on that bluff out there uh, in, sometime in the winter. And they're walking along. And they see a hand sticking up out of the ground, out of the frozen ground. Paul law enforcement, the sheriff goes out, puts a tent over the hand, and puts a heater in there, and thaws out the ground to the point that they can dig it up, and it's attached to a female body. And apparently, rigor mortis or something that caused her hand to go up in the air like that, and come up out of the ground uh, after she'd been buried. Uh, the the uh, body still had hairs on it, uh, but unidentified, uh, the person had been shot in the back of the head. Uh, no idea who it was or who did it or anything else at this point. Uh, not too much later, I think maybe the following spring, they find the body of a uh, young woman dumped at Beaver Tail Hill, down off the side of the highway that rolled up against the fence, down at the base of the toe for the, the cut there. Uh, this one was still fairly fresh. Uh, there was still a, a dress on her. Uh, and uh, at, at some point, we were eventually able to identify uh, that person as a girl from uh, the Seattle area who uh, had also been shot in the back of the head. Uh, sometime that summer, uh, well actually during this entire time frame, there were a lot of people that were having their houses broken into, particularly single women, and prowlers would be coming in and breaking into the house and doing stuff scaring the hell out of them, uh, and this was creating a lot of concern. But, but late summer, there's a, uh, a uh, or early fall, uh, there's a double homicide in Hamilton. A couple by the name of Shook. Uh, the Shooks had uh, children. I'm sorry, this book's coming apart, and now all my pages are out of order. But, uh, they're, uh, I can't find it now, but anyway, uh, the intruder had come in here. 
to this family here. This is the, the couple or, or the shooks and then there's their kid. And down underneath is the, the house. The, the intruder had come in, uh, he had tied her to the bed with uh, clothesline. stabbed or shot the husband, I can't remember either stabbed or shot her, uh, and then while the kids were asleep upstairs, lit fire to the house. Well, luckily, neighbors saw the flames coming out the windows, came, rescued the kids, and they were able to get the fire out in time to do some investigation on the homicide. The sheriff at that time in the Valley County was a guy by the name of Dale Dodd. Dale was very he played things close to his chest. He didn't like to you know, get involved with other law enforcement. In fact, he was so suspicious of any other law enforcement that if, if any law enforcement officer from out of county entered Ravalli County, he had to call the sheriff and tell him you were entering the county so he knew you were there. And that's how, how, how jealous he was of his territory. And so he wasn't the kind of guy that would share notes with other law enforcement agencies talk much about what was going on, but he had a suspect down there. I mean, he thought it was somebody from from the fundamentalist Mormon uh, community at Pinedale, and that's what he was in. Well, um, following spring, or I guess maybe it was later that fall, we find yet another body out east of town in Crystal Creek, which is about one drainage east of Deer Creek. This one was just a skeleton, female skeleton. Been there for a while, obviously. It also had been executed in the back of the head with bullet holes. Uh, to this day, we don't know who it is or, or much more about it beyond what I just told you. But we got all these murders going on and all these bodies showing up of young women. Uh, and, and really, no leads. Now, Wayne, it turns out, was back in Missoula during this time. Should be another one here in a minute. Well, maybe not. <laughs> one more. Okay. I always thought it was one long and two short. But anyway. Uh, working at Conlon's Furniture Store there on, the, on the south side of town. And the, the manager of Conlon's was a really attractive red-haired gal by the name of Christine Wells. This is a picture of Christine and her husband, Doug. Doug was a, a gunsmith by trade. Uh, and uh, Wayne's job at Conlon's was as a furniture delivery so he'd deliver furniture to houses all over western Montana, including into Valley County and including the Shook House. And including some of these places where women lived that had had breakage, because they'd bought furniture from Pondlands and Wayne was the delivery person. Uh, but one afternoon, actually early evening, uh, in early September, Doug and Christine are coming home. They've been out. It's about twilight. And they lived in the Orchard Homes area. So they're going into their house for some wrestling in the bushes alongside the house. <clears throat> out of the bushes steps Wayne Nance. And he says, <clears throat> it's Wayne from the store. My truck broke down a couple of blocks away. Can I come in and use your phone? And they said, well, sure, come on in. Wayne's got a bag with him. And as they turn around to go back in, he reaches in the bag and he pulls out a lead pipe. And he whacks Doug over the head with him. Doug goes down and then he pulls out of the bag a 22 caliber revolver. He points it at Christine. And with his other hand, he produces some white clothesline. He says, let's, uh, let's go in the house, help Doug up, and let's get in there. So they, he marches him in, marches him down the basement stairs and into the basement. 
with the clothesline rope, he, he at gunpoint tells Christine to tie Doug to a post in the basement. He has Doug sit down, so he's sitting with his hands behind his back, behind the post. And he has Christine tie him up. He then marches her back up the stairs, down the hall, and to the master bedroom. In the master bedroom, he has her lay spread eagle on the bed, and then with more clothesline rope and his, his knife, he starts cutting off lengths and starts tying her spread eagle to the four corners of the bed. Along the way, he takes his knife and he starts cutting off her clothes to explore his torso. Pretty soon he leaves, goes down into the basement. <laughs> According to the wells, as he's becoming almost like he's in a trance. He's talking to himself and he's telling how he's, he's got to be smart, he can't make any mistakes. Uh, and he's mumbling this stuff and he's back and forth two or three times. Every time he goes up, he cuts a little more on Christine and back down. The last time he comes down, there's Doug pressed up against the post. Wayne takes out his knife and stabs Doug in the chest. Pulls out the knife and sees some blood on it. It's like wipes it off on Doug's pants and sticks it in his pocket and then nods a lot when he heads back up the stairs. Here's Doug stabbed in the chest. He's woozy and the room starts getting black. All of a sudden it just goes black. Somehow or not he manages to pull himself out of it. He doesn't know if he's been out for a second or a minute or half an hour, but he knows this guy's upstairs with his wife. So he looks around the room and over in the corner he sees an old lever action savage rifle in the corner. Uh, and he's working he's knots behind his back and somehow he manages to untie the knots. He gets himself free, he staggers over and he gets the gun, he looks around and he can find one bullet. He loads the gun, he goes to the stairs, but he, he's just too weak, he can't make it up the stairs. So he takes the gun and he hits the wall making a noise, figuring that'll bring away. Well, sure enough, Wayne appears at the head of the stairs and takes the gun and fires. Hits Wayne in the groin, but just like me, Wayne didn't go down. And somehow, summoning up superhuman strength, he, he, he takes the gun, he grabs it by the barrel, and he bounds up the stairs and starts wailing on Wayne, using the gun as a club. Wayne's doing a crab walk back down the hall towards the bedroom. Pulls out his pistol, he shoots Doug in the leg. But that doesn't stop Doug, he keeps coming after him. They get into the bedroom, and at this point, Christine has managed to untie one hand, and she's trying to hit Wayne and Doug, you know, get out of the way! And Wayne fires another shot, it goes wild into the ceiling, and then another one, the room goes black. Doug dies across the bed. In a nightstand, he's got a pistol, he grabs a pistol, he turns on a light, turns around, and Wayne's on the floor, dying. From a bullet from his own gun. Now, whether he shot himself on purpose or in the uh, melee, nobody knows. But it was his own gun that, that killed him. Doug collapses on the floor. Uh, Christine. Uh, calls 911. The sheriff responds. This is a picture of Christine when, when they get there. You can see the blood on her and how distraught she is. I think she may still even have some, uh, some knots tied on her hands. Um, Doug went in the hospital. He was in the hospital, I think, for about six weeks. Uh, the wound had nicked the sack on his heart, but it hadn't actually punctured the heart itself. It was a very serious life threatening injury, but he, he survived. Uh, when he was well enough to talk, uh, we had an inquest. And the picture below is a picture of me holding the rifle that he was using as a club. And that's Doug looking up at it. And it, it 
probably can't see it very well from where you're at, but you'll see if you look closely that that gun is bent almost into an L. And if you can imagine the amount of force that was used to bend a rifle into an L shape, beating on wing, you can get some idea of the, uh, the, the violence that was occurring during this melee. Um, well, after, after Wayne was, was uh, killed, uh, a search warrant was executed on his home in East Missoula, where he lived with his dad. And in his home, a lot of interesting things were happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, incidentally, here's a copy or picture of the post that, that Doug was tied to in the basement. You see the blood on it, and the ropes are still hung around it. The other picture is of the bedroom where, where, where the final acts occurred. But in the search of uh, Wayne's house, was found some interesting things. You see on top uh, a, a ceramic elk and also a knife. Uh, this is a very unique handmade uh, couple of items. Both items were handmade uh, and one of a kind. Both of them came out of the Shook house uh, and were easily identified as being uh, from, from the Shook's property. Uh, and there was actually a photograph of Wayne uh, giving this elk to his dad as a Christmas present that year. But Wayne had obviously taken these things as, as trophies uh, from the Shook house. Uh, and it makes it pretty clear that he uh, was involved in, uh, in that. He, he had a, a huge uh, crush on Christine Wells. He kept his scrapbook. He had over 40 photographs of it. He had uh, things that he, he made up himself, taking things that she'd written, like memos or work orders or that sort of thing, and uh, cutting words out and then pasting them back together uh, into messages. So he had one that said, Wayne, I love you, love Christine, and her hand taped inside, I think, his uh, lunchbox or his toolbox. The, the girl whose body was found with the uh, with the dress out at Beavertail Hill is this girl, Devonna Nelson, uh, and uh, witnesses put her together with Wayne Nance uh, shortly before she disappeared. Uh, but the other side of this shows some really interesting stuff. The, these are photo, the top two are photographs taken from one of those photo booths. That's Wayne and uh, a girl known only as Robin. Witnesses in East Missoula said, yeah, there was a girl that showed up that, named Robin that was with Wayne for a couple of weeks and then she just disappeared. Uh, the uh, skeleton that was found with the hand sticking up out of the ground <coughs> had hairs on it. Uh, when the search was done of Wayne's property, he had a topper on the back of his pickup and stuck in some hinges and the topper were some hairs. Those hairs were compared to the hairs on the skeleton above the Milltown Dam and they were identical. It was her hair. And uh, what was, was likely this girl Robin who uh, disappeared. And we know she was together with Wayne because uh, we got pictures that, that he had. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Chrissy Crystal Creek the skeleton, we've never, never been able to produce any more evidence on that. Uh, as I say, the Wellses were, were major heroes in this affair. Uh, they, for years, have got back to the uh, FBI Academy and have uh, talked to uh, law enforcement officers in training about the behavior and characteristics of a uh, serial killer because they're one of the few couples who ever actually dealt with a serial killer to the extent they didn't live to tell them. Now, there's a postscript all
Remember Donna Cavalli, the school teacher with the knife in her chest? And the blob of semen on her, on her, on her thigh? Well, um, years later when we, uh, the DNA came around, I thought, God, I wish we had that, D that semen. If we could type it, maybe we could solve this case. But I thought it was a long gone. Well, about 10 years ago, there was a detective at the Missoula City Police Department who was digging around in the evidence locker, and he found it. He found the blob of the semen. It was not on a slide, but there was enough to, enough to get a type for DNA. So he did that. And then he started going around to everybody that he knew had anything to do with Donna Kamali uh, to get swabs to see if we could find out the guy. Uh, well, one of the guys that uh, he contacted, or known to have some contact with her, uh, was the person who at the time of her death was an assistant Missoula County coroner by the name of Neil Morris. Back in the 70s and before uh, coroner's duties were handled by undertakers. Nowadays, the sheriff is in those days, it was typically an undertaker. And the undertaker, who was a coroner in the 70s, was a guy by the name of Larry Livingston. And his uh, assistant was a guy by the name of Neil Morris. So this detective gets a hold of Neil Morris and says, hey, we need to get a DNA swap for him. Uh, Morris proceeds out to the parking lot of the funeral home and blows his brains out. Uh, well, it was his DNA on the, on, the, uh, on the swap. So that case was solved. Obviously, Wade Nance had nothing to do with it. But, but we know of at least, for sure, five killings that Wade Nance did. There's others that he probably did, and certainly, if he'd been successful, he would have uh, killed uh, the Wells as well. But uh, instead, they got the job taken care of for him. So.